return of the great rotational throw model, why only NASA can re-engineer the wheel, a case study in the history of the most efficient and consistent rotational throwing model. And I talk about NASA here because when they went to the moon, they had to, they couldn't take regular wheels for their moon rover. So they had to create a, a mesh, I'm not sure if it was a light metal or a carbon fiber, it was a mesh material that when put together it created a wheel and it supported the lunar rover. The problem is it only worked on the moon in one sixth gravity. So they redefined a rotational object, but it only worked on our planet. That's kind of similar to what we're going to talk about today is we started the rotation in the 1970s and then we played around with it up until the 2000s where I would say <clears throat> we got away from the most efficient effort and now we've gone back to the original model. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll see some, some numbers here uh, showing us that. So this, we have, um, this is the average top 10 throwers per year, top 10 athlete throwers in, in shot put. Uh, I, only, I only took the IWF list uh, for this lecture. I didn't, I didn't take the time to go all the way back uh, with the other list just because this is uh, a lot easier just off the website. And it gives us a pretty good snapshot, right? And we see <clears throat> uh, a steady, steady increase in how far people are throwing. And in the last few years, we're seeing a huge spike, right? Uh, steady, the longest, the longest growth cycle in the whole chart with a massive spike this last year. It was a great year for shot put, wasn't it? Tons of far throws, tons of far throws. <clears throat> now, this chart is the top 10 throws every year, okay? So this, this represents maybe, uh, depending on the year, it was, well, let's see this chart here. <clears throat> this is how many athletes comprise the top 10 throws. Okay, so we have 1999, five athletes were dispersed across the top 10 throws registered in the world, okay? And so by this chart, we see the number of athletes getting the top throws is going down. So the best athletes are getting better more consistently. And we come back here to the top 10 throws, you see the, the, the average distance of those top 10 throws is massive, it's even bigger than the top 10 throwers in the world. So this shows us that the best throwers are getting even better, okay? <clears throat> Timeline here. Uh, Rotational throw started. Um, USSR coach Alexiev invents the rotational shot in 1972. Alexander Baryshnikov was the first to use it. Um, Anatoly Bonnichuk, who was my coach, uh, he coaches Baryshnikov for, I can't remember exactly if it's a six months or a year, we're about somewhere around 1972, 1976, where Bonnichuk learns these, these principles that Alexia used. Um, so for, for credit, I'm, I'm including just a, a YouTube link here at the bottom of where the, the source video is taken from. <clears throat> First man to ever throw rotation in the shop, and we're seeing specifically on entry, his left leg stays bent the entire time, the left leg never extends on entry. We see uh, very flat hips and shoulders all the way through, there's not a whole lot of up and down from the entry into the middle. It's very flat. You only get a little bit of rise right at the finish. And the final, we see bent legs, specifically a bent front leg. He's away from the right. He's loaded on the front leg and throwing around his front leg. So this is what the, the very first time we saw the rotation look like. Then uh, Brian Oldfield first adopts the rotation and a few Americans thereafter. Uh, in about the mid-1970s. And then Oldfield, by his own account, masters the rotation in 1984. Uh, so this is this is early Brian throwing with the rotation. We see the same bent leg entry, not extending. He does it even better than, than Barishnikov. That back leg does not extend coming out of the back key. Instead, what's happening here is they're, they're pulling themselves in with that right leg. The right leg and hip and shoulder are pulling them in. They don't have to push off the left. And that creates a very, very flat flat uh, body positioning through the middle here. There's almost no rise in the shoulders and hips. Now Brian, he went and did a lot of what we would call lift or jump in the front. Uh, 
so this was his very early variation. He gets up here, bent legs, bent legs, and he goes pretty straight for um, uh, more of a right side loaded release, okay? Varishnikov loaded on the left, towing around, and, and Brian here a little bit more, maybe 50-50 on his legs, kind of throwing off his right a little bit behind him. Now, he says this is his best career throw ever. I don't think, I don't think it went as far as, uh, as the world record he set in 1976, was it? Uh, <clears throat> but again, we see the entry, bent left. Bent left, never extends, it never jumps up. Again, he's very, very flat, hips and shoulders flat, flat through. The thing about this finish is, I think, you know, Brian, he says bent legs longer. That left leg is more bent at the front, and he gets, he gets able to get more rotation from the shoulders at the final. That he jumps less, he waits longer to jump. Okay, so this is um, Brian took Varishnikov's model, tried to improve upon it right away, and then over time he found more efficiency and he came closer to Varishnikov. Okay. <clears throat> then we have uh, rotation technique continually degrades uh, in the 2008 with uh, Art Vegas, John Medina, and uh, John Smith and Dan Taylor around 2008. Now listen, take this with a grain of salt. These are um, fantastic coaches and fantastic athletes. This is just a biomechanic look at what's happening with technique. Okay, and I, I know with, with Dan specifically, he was a he was a special case, and um, you know John John likes to coach a lot of different ways and do a lot of different techniques. And, and Dan Dan was proof of throwing with a model that looked very very different. But Dan is a six foot nine. 350 pound man, and for 99% of the throwers in the world who want to be better, that's not going to work. So, um, oh, let me back up. Um, oh, we did it. Venegas is an important player, too, here. The Bonnie Chuck and Venegas in this timeline. Uh, the first time we talk about Venegas is uh, they're, they're going to tie up here at the end. Let's keep him in mind. Uh, oh wait, I forgot. I've got a joke in here. So Brian was the barrier breaker, right? Everyone knows that. And then we'll call Brian the good one, mostly because he's really, really bad, right? Uh, and then uh, Jack McNeil will be the bad, and Dan Taylor is the ugly. But <laughs> um, so John's model. <clears throat> Starting to see a little bit of lift out of the back. Now, this is the first time we're going to talk about um, uh, what's practice versus what, what is done in competition. Um, we're seeing a little bit of lift, a little bit of jumping out of the back here. We definitely see a steep increase in the hips and the shoulders rising to the middle and then, and then trying to come down to the front, but he ends up being very much, much taller. Very, very tall final here. The legs are much straighter. And uh, John, uh, especially if you look at his video from the 96 games, very, very right side throwing. They went at the front, just a tiny little touch off that left leg, and the whole the rest of the throw happens off the right side. Um, and then Randy, too, would talk about like, not, not thinking about the left side, only concerning yourself with that right side. Um, and what you see here when you load on that right a lot is you get very, very tall and you end up behind the toe board. Um, so you're automatically losing distance. Instead of getting that shoulder out and around the left, you're sitting back. Okay. So <clears throat> that's what that's what John shows us. And then Dan here, very, very much of a jump sprint up, and then very, very tall up and around again here. Um, now, these professionals, this, um, they're all, the dynamic they have is, uh, all, it's all pretty good compared to what you're going to see at the high school and college level, right? But uh, uh, typical high school kid who's using this technique, uh, the technique model, you're going to see like this leg is going to go straight up. Um, you know, they're going to be coming down real hard on that leg in the middle. Um, but so I think, you know, biomechanically, this is probably, this Dan was probably the peak of getting away from what's really, really efficient. Um, all right, Bonnie Chuck, USSR coach, when they collapsed, he went to Kuwait, I think, and coached for a 
few years, and then he comes to Canada. He comes to Canada to begin training Dylan Armstrong, who was a hammer pro at the time. Within two years, Armstrong breaks 21 meters at the Beijing Games, and he's going to, he eventually is going to go on to get the bronze um, from that Games. So when that happens, there's, there's a, a note that the rest of the world like, okay, Bonachuk's doing something, uh, this is Dylan Armstrong, and here we see, we come back to a more true bent leg on the entry, very much flat sweeping, the hips and shoulders don't rise anymore. And then on the final, we're looking at uh, a bent, bent left leg and the shoulders going around and forward off that front leg. Okay, so this, this is, at this time, this was new. People didn't see this technique in 2008, 2010. Okay, this was, nobody was throwing like this. <clears throat> so Dylan was the first one. Now, 2008, 2013, uh, Dr. Bonachuk, um, Dylan, and myself, we conduct training camps in Chile, um, periodically, mostly in April. <clears throat> we would go down there, and Art Venegas was uh, one of the throws coaches at the Dylan training center in Chile Vista. And he watched our training sessions. You know, we talked, right? And at the time, Art didn't have, he didn't have any shot put talent. He wasn't working with any, any shot put talent. Um, but, you know, talking and learning. And, um, also, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name. I, I don't know him as Bestie. He's a uh, uh, global throwing. He has uh, Daniel Stahl in the discus right now. Uh, good group of throwers. One, another excellent, excellent coach in the world. Uh, I guess we'll just say uh, Kostein's best team. He also come down and, and uh, have quite a bit of camp time with his group. So we're all there over the course of a few years. So Dylan, everyone's peaked about Dylan. But Dylan was always a big athlete. He was always good. Like, okay, you know, yeah, Dylan can throw a hammer fart, he can throw a shot fart. I came along, and when I broke 21 meters, then the rest of the coaches around the world said, there's, there's something different happening. There's something about this technique that would allow a 46 foot college thrower to throw almost 70 feet. Um, and so here again, we're looking at you know flat hips through, flat shoulders, uh, taking off of a bent, bent left leg back here, and then a really bent left at the front, rotating the shoulders around. <coughs> uh, okay, Kovacs moves to Chula Vista in 2012. Venegas gets shot by talent for the first time in I don't know what, 10 years. Uh, and then 2014 and 2017, Kovacs, Durrell Hill, and uh, Art Venegas, they have great technique. They start posting big time goal numbers, really, really good examples. Um, Daniel Stahl, coached by Hyde Swanson, exhibits great technique from 2016 when he really broke out and started hitting some big numbers. And then uh, we're also going to look at Walsh and Krauser. Um, they're developing outside this timeline. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're I went Barishnikov, Bonachuk, Bonachuk to Canada, to Chula Vista, Venegas, and now we have Darrell Hill, Joe Kovac, Ryan Carlson, all out of Chula Vista. Okay, so this gives you an example of where these techniques have gone through in time. All right, uh, Sean Pickering, uh, he worked for UK Athletics, he's 1998, he runs in the shot, I think he's a Welsh athlete. Uh, he does a lot of, um, at least he did a lot of announcing for um, track coverage. So if you've seen some really good British accented track coverage, it's probably this guy. Uh, solid, solid man, does a lot of traveling, does a, goes to a lot of training camps. And he provided me with a lot of, um, all the video of, of these three models today. Came directly from him. Uh, all right, let's go to the notes here. Full spin from Joe here. We're, we're going to look at these competition videos from these guys at full speed because that's really how you get an idea of, of what's happening with the dynamics. Um, we see very, very flat. Um, now, with all these guys, they get a huge extension out of the back. They're taking off the bend left here uh, and they're pulling themselves in with that right side. And they're pulling themselves in so hard. They're getting a huge extension out of that right hip, and it's pulling them forward. And to the eye, it can almost look like they're going up. But if you put up a if you put up a grid on this, there's very very little vertical displacement in their body getting into that first step. They're reaching so far that that big muscle mass comes up, 
and it looks like they're going up. So very, very flat here. And then, and then length of final. Okay, that's another thing with these, these two guys at full speed. When they hit double support, it's a whole other time zone to, until the shot was released. Okay, so a lot of times you see athletes they come down and it's like a tiny little touch and the ball's gone. It's like a, a pop reaction, almost like they get in a car accident. That's done. These guys, they hit double support and it's a whole big slingshot action around, much, much longer. Ryan Crowder. Um, so now, his, his film looks a little slower because he's so tall, he's moving on a longer path, right? So it's another thing, when you watch the film, um, speed, the film can lie to you about speed because it's hard to see the exact path that the body's taking. And on film, it looks slow, but actually what you're seeing is a longer path in a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional object. Okay, so keep in mind that you know, just because something might look slower or whatever, um, it, they might be a taller athlete, they might be a longer pass they're taking. Ryan does a really, really good job with his bent leg out the middle. He doesn't come up at all. He's so tall, he can just kind of reach out, just turn that right side in that first step and get where he needs to be. And then Ryan's right leg in the final here, in the slow motion, we'll see it better, but he, he gets that foot completely turned around, okay? That's a byproduct of him shifting to his front leg and rotating shoulders, okay? This foot doesn't go first. His upper body goes first, and his right leg follows the action. His right leg's doing nothing, except it's just a tripod piece to keep him from falling over. There's zero force production from his back leg. He's throwing off his front leg. And again, very, very rotational ground. Uh, okay, Tom Walsh. He's in here. Uh, one, not American. Let's get some uh, some uh, variety here. But he also gave this a slightly little uh, different start with his foot so far back, but he's hitting the same principles. Okay, he's pulling himself into the right side, bent left take, uh, bent left on the takeoff, and a massive, massive strike in the ground. He's rotating his body around his front leg on the final here. Okay, so with these guys at full speed in competition, what I want, what we should be looking at is the length of rotation on entry, the flat transition to the front, and then the length of rotation on the final. Okay. All throwers, all throwers should be rotating long on the back and rotating long on the front. Long path, okay, long path. Not necessarily the time, but they should be going a long time around themselves. And how you do that is you must rotate around this left. On the back, you post that left and you move the right around it. And at the front, you post that left and you have to move the shoulders around your left. Okay, this is where Sean really takes off. Sean goes to the, these big time training centers and he gets slow motion, high quality video from the world's best athletes in training environments. Okay, so we get a different look. <clears throat> This is a really good look at how flat the hips and shoulders stay across, okay? Very, very good look here. Also, for coming into center, you can see how much, uh, I, I coach sides of the body for throwing, left side and right side, and you can see how much he gets the shot put, right shoulder, right hip and foot in the center, okay? It's not just the foot coming down ahead of himself, he's getting the whole side of his body ahead of the rest, okay? And that's from this heavy rotation on entry. Um, rotating around yourself. <clears throat> and then uh, another key element today, something I've noticed the last couple of years is uh, a lot of collapsed heels in, in the center here. Um, and people have asked me, how, how do we prevent that heel from, from collapsing down? Uh, one of them is, the main way is to get this, this right, the sweep leg, as it comes around the corner, as soon as you hit the corner, it has to come straight to the ground. Get as low as you can to the ground before the step. And you attack the step, not from the back of the South African, but you attack the step from three o'clock. Okay, so you go, rotates around the outside, and it brings the foot back in from the side of the circle. 
and that that pre-turns the side, but also allows him to bring his foot very, very flat. He doesn't have to recompensate the gravitational effect of his body hitting the ground. He's not hitting the ground and collapsing his heel. He's just he's he's transitioning into the ground and moving right off his right right away. Right? He doesn't have to catch himself. And then <clears throat> up here at the front, the dynamic of after the first step, the second step pulls around the body. Right here, I like to think about you pull the left glute, the left shoulder and the left glute pull, and you push down through the heel, butt through the heel. I, I like to see the foot come flat at the front here a little bit. I, one of my academic uh, curiosities is I wonder if Joe had a bit of a flat foot up here if he could throw even further. Um, but the idea of this left step rotating around, pushing through the glute down, okay? Very, very efficient. When, when we watch these guys, there's not a lot of movement on the body. And yes, they're stronger than the average thrower, but the lack of movement is the training, the technique, right? You watch the video of Dan Taylor, there's a lot more movement in the limbs. These guys are not moving at all. Here we see, you know, post up this left side, move, fall, shoulder, hip, around that left, okay? This is, this is uh, synonymous with not falling in, but this takes it to a, to a different level of the right side is the mover, okay? He's not, he's not pulling himself in with the left and then dragging the right to catch up. He's posting the left and pushing the whole right side around. You got Ryan, same views. Again, you see, now Ryan's really good where you see the extension, extension of that right on entry, but it's not up. It, look, it kind of looks like he's going up, but he's almost falling under that, falling under that first step. But again, pre-turn side, and Ryan, now, these throws for Ryan were, were really, really easy, okay? So he, he wasn't really cranking on them, but watch his right foot here. It turns, it turns through, and he's got the weight on the front. <clears throat> there's, there's, not, there's no push from that right leg through the ball. Opens the shoulders, and the leg and the hips snap through because he's turning the shoulders so fast. Okay, it's so another thing. If you have you have athletes who they're breaking in the middle, okay, got the hips back. Uh, don't. <clears throat> I prefer to cue them on working their chest more because if you are loaded on the front leg and you crank the left arm around, that's how I tell them: row your left shoulder and bench press your right shoulder. When you do this first, it automatically pulls your hips into line, okay? And it's much faster. At competition speed, you don't have time to separate the parts of your body. And with your weaker throwers, if you get their lower body ahead of them, they're not strong enough to come back with this. Chocolate's gonna keep them back. So, torso is much, much stronger, it's more connected to the ball. You get up to the front, you crank the shoulders, Hip and leg fall into, and fall into place. Right in the back. <clears throat> this is a really good look at put a line right at the top of his left side and look at how far that right hip and right shoulder come around. Okay, around himself, around himself. Pre turn step, and then that left side, this is a good look at that left side rotating back around to the front. Okay, he's not, this is another thing when, when your athletes are ready to put their foot down, these principles go for a shot like this, by the way. When they want to put that foot down, don't, don't let them lead to the toe, okay? If the athlete leads to the toe in the front, they can put that toe down anywhere they please. If you tell them to push, push through their heel, the heel can only go one place. So you'll get a much, much more consistent uh, foot placement at the front. And you can see that here. He's pulling that left side, the whole thing into, into one place. I'm trying to remember if any of these guys actually give me a <coughs> flat, left, flat left at the front. I think Brian does it. Yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> this is something else. Grounding that left on the heel for just a microsecond cheats your ability to shift to the front, okay? Because if you put the toe down, you can still stay back. If you force to push the hip down, force to put the heel down, it automatically pulls the hips forward, okay? So even if just for a moment that foot comes into the flat, it's gonna, it's gonna aid your athlete in shifting forward. And for these reasons, this, this is why Ryan is better 
the, the better thrower than the other guys. I mean, yeah, he's taller, but um, he's better body mechanically. He, he, he moves better. Um, and he's got much more bent legs, and he actually gets that heel down. Joe, we saw, doesn't put the heel down, and Tom here doesn't put the heel down as well. Tom is really going to look at a big extension, not a whole lot of vertical displacement in the throw. Now, one of the things that, that, that Tom, we saw this in Joe's throw a little bit too, he was on his toes, and he kind of was lifting into the ball a little bit. Um, and, and Tom does it here too. I, I think this is a mistake, is when you look at their, their competition videos, they're not changing direction, right? They were, they were staying on the same linear path going around themselves, and they weren't, they weren't coming down and then trying to get extra time and energy up into the ball. And Tom, this is a really nice video from Tom here from the back. He, he starts way over here in the back, but he still pulls that right really far around. And when we watch him on film, it looks like it takes a long, long time. It's because he's going so far around. He gets that right side all the way around his left. And then it comes into bad legs, and he's really, really patient in front. And it gets one step, two step, and then a whole separate release process after that steps down. First step, second step, shoulders around. Right around left, left around right, right around left. <clears throat> You've got a little lip, uh, look at the discus thrower, Daniel Stahl. Um, all these videos are from Chula Vista. Uh, it's kind of nice worked in with the, the timeline that we presented. Um, then we're looking at bent out of the back, pulling in the center, bent legs in the front. Do you still think about pulling the, or putting the heel down in the front to help bring the hip around mm -hmm. and the disc too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's um it's kind of. Right before the foot's ready to touch down, you start you start pushing through the hip and, and looking with the heel for placement. And right right before that foot touches down is where you're going to engage the left shoulder to start pulling the open. Okay. Um, so for training, some, sometimes we practice you know landing and double support wrapped up. Okay, and that's good for understanding. But in terms of execution, that's impossible. So when, when the athletes are speeding up and you're actually trying to put force on the ball, you're, uh, you're, you're going to end up pre-opening. Okay? All of these guys, everybody who actually does anything with an implement with ball out, they land open. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the next piece we're gonna get into here is, all right, what's trained versus what's actually executed. This is where all this information comes to implies for systems coaches. I practice, you know, sprint that leg in from the entry, you get to the front, on your toes, triple extension, lift for the ball, right? That's what this looked like. That was 17 meters all through my college season. 17 was a really good throw for me. It was like 1660, 1690 is kind of my average. Went to my national meet, got all excited. I said, okay, if I'm going to beat this guy, all I have to do is get to the front faster, right? This is what it looked like. I threw a meter further, fantastic. And then I got home, I went back and looked at the video, and I thought, oh, I could have thrown even further. If only, if only I had a triple extended of that, used that right leg and lifted to the ball, I could have thrown even further, maybe 1830. Stupid boy. <laughs> no, I threw a meter further because this leg was bent. Okay. A lot of times, what we're taught and what we practice for understanding of the body mechanics, the understanding of how to move our body, doesn't translate to how to actually throw far because it's different. It's like the wheel on the moon, right? It's different speeds. Okay. Another, another thing with my athletes is non-weighted drills, we do them very, very seldom. If we're doing drills, they have to implement their hands, especially in this case, because it's a lot of force out there. It's a lot of energy to compensate, and 
the way of the implement can help you in the pro. Okay? I work with athletes all the time. World championship throwers with nothing in their hands. You put one, you know, 2K in their hand, and they can't do anything to break apart. Um, so if you practice this, you get this by mistake. If you practice this, you get this. Okay. Um, I don't know about you, but this looks a lot stronger than this over here. A lot stronger. And everybody can do it. Everybody can do this. It's not, you have to be an enormous athlete to move like this. You just need to be coached to move like this. Okay? And it's easier to coach these principles. There's less cues. There's less stuff going on. You got to start on the other one. Okay? So some of you doing a really good job of it. Um, Dane Miller, garage strength, he's in the Eastern PA. He's chalking athletes out there, but you know, they do a lot of strength training too, but he's, he's incorporating these principles with his kids, and, and it works. Um, okay, training versus executing. Uh, okay, we talked about skills, what I was saying, skills of transfer. Oh, what time is it? Where are we at? Then 905. 905. Oh, okay, crap. Okay. All right, <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw some bigger names on the bus now. No, okay. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Nelson, Don, Babbitt, and, and Reese Hoffman. Okay, this is an example of uh, training theory versus video evidence of the career best throws. Uh, there's numerous videos on YouTube of these guys training, coaching, getting clinics, and talking about, you know, pre-turning, you know, getting the foot turned on their own, big hip separation, you know, lifting it up, and you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you look at the career best throws of these two athletes on video, they're not doing, they're not doing this. They're doing this in their best throws, okay? And if we go all the way to the back, to the, to the graphs, and that's where we're all done, we go back to the graphs. We go all the way back to the graphs. When those guys were in their heyday, 2000, 2008, where was the graph? It was down, right? We still had far throws, but we didn't really have consistent far throws because they were by accident. They were getting far throws by accident. They weren't training to get those far throws. They weren't training the technique to get the far throws. But now, our best athletes are, right? Kovacs, Krauser, they're training this way. And what happened to the average? They blew the roof off. Blew the roof off. Um, okay. Flat rotation, move the leg movement. Talk about this is an easier, easier way to coach your athletes. Um, you can get away with it. One word cues. Um, one word cues. Um, it's it. You each athlete is allowed an individual discrepancy for how their body needs to move, but the principles are all the same, right? They need to get the right side pushed around the left. They need to use the right side has to be the motor to get in. The whole right side of the body has to be in before anything else. You can't reach for the step. You have to have bent legs at the front. No matter how, no matter what else you're doing at the front, the legs have to be bent all the way through the moment of, of uh, an ultimate uh, power of, of um, release on the hand. Okay, those things hold true. You can coach every athlete the same way. Make sure they hit those items, and and they'll do pretty well. Um, now this comes, you know, don't be carried away. Don't think. Don't think too highly of yourself as a coach. And athletes work best, most athletes work best with little brain stimulus while they're working. Okay? You give an athlete a big extended cue, a whole big extended idea of all the stuff to do, it's gonna get in the way. If you tell them just one simple, just one thing, like you just need to move this side, or you need to get this step down sooner, okay? And just say, like, uh, you know, let's say at the front. Uh, oh no, let's say on, on entry. Let's say the athlete's over rotating, okay? Over rotating big time. Tell them just you have to put your foot down sooner. Do everything the same, but you're gonna put your foot down on the ground sooner. That's the only cue you get, is down sooner. And it might take a few reps for them to understand what you're after, but once they understand it, okay, you know, one cue, one easy, and they don't have to change anything in their movement. It's the same movement. They're just going to do one thing a little sooner. Um, simple cues, let's see, 
do, oh, when you're training your app, can you do question? Paralysis by analysis? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of times, like, uh, there, there, there's a line between you and the athlete getting on the same page, hitting a level of understanding, but then moving on from that and getting back to work with little, little being said between you. It's the same way as uh, uh, drills. Okay, when I do drills with my athletes, they're mostly weighted, and we're going to do three or four to gain level of understanding, and then we're going to go back to work throwing. Okay? It's the same idea of, of uh, you know, doing a technical element to gain the understanding of how your body moves. But when you actually go to work, it's going to look a little different, right, in the, in the technique. Um, all right, you've got really good kids who are going to go on to college. They can go on and develop more. This is really hard, but there are things you can do as coaches to get that athlete an extra five inches today, an extra three inches today. But it might be too much stimulus, too much advancement for them, and where they're not going to get a meter when they go to college. Okay. So keep in mind, when you're developing athletes from the ground up, you want to do as very little uh, stimulus, as basic stimulus as you can for as long as you can. And that's how we get long-term growth from athletes. Okay. So don't get don't get too carried away, especially if you've got a kid who's going to be a really good high school recruit. College coaches, okay, this is the balance for you. You you have a kid who's a total beast, four-time state champion in the, in the girls' distance. Fantastic, right? But she might not develop as a college athlete. Okay? So what's more important is, is with, the, with these athletes, <coughs> college coaches are not looking for super developed athletes, looking for athletes who can throw far, looking for athletes who are consistent performers, right, who can compete well, but if the athlete's tapped out, they're not, they're not recruitable anymore, okay, and, and to be frank, a lot of the reason is college coaches, okay, I'll call it coaches, a lot of co college coaches aren't as good as you might think they are, okay? a lot of them, they want to bring the kids in, stack the weight in the weight room, give them the same technique every other kid gets, and you know they increase ten feet. Okay, a few points of count for me. Job done. Okay, that's that's the industry. That's the way it goes. There are there are good coaches in college, but a lot of it is just that. Okay, so if you don't have an athlete who really needs that college scholarship, get on the horn, talk to this college coach, and say, what are you looking for? You know, do you you know how much meat do you need left on on the bone of this athlete? And that's going to dictate what you do with cues and what you do with the. Um, advancement of your training protocols. Uh, simple cues, simple learning. When you go to a big competition, go to a big show, you can't be right next to the athlete, it goes a long way for your communication and the, uh, the confidence of that that you need 30, 40, 50 feet away, you give them one hand gesture, right? Or one word. One word, one hand gesture, you just communicate a whole idea of something that they need to fix. Kinetic comprehension. Uh, Dane Miller, uh, Trevor Slitzman, and uh, they work with a, a, a doctor put this book together. They have a breakdown of rotational shot, glide shot, rotational discus. And this is just an example of one page from one element of throw. They, they, they're giving you um, lines indicating muscle, muscle contraction, muscle action, what the muscles are doing what's happening in the throw, and at the bottom of these pages are giving you simple cues to implement these, these changes, okay? And the stuff in this book is, is the training principles we talked about today, okay? Does anybody else need this slide for garagestrength.com? It's in their book section somewhere in there, okay? So, um, like I said, he's, he's the one I talked about earlier, he's running these techniques for this high school case, they're getting a lot of, a lot of results out of it. Uh, da -da -da. Um, yeah, please, if you don't know about our products, please come to the table right outside the door here to the left. Um, stop by. Uh, I, I tell people um, with the shop foot gloves, even if you don't want to get them, you might know somebody who want, might want to get them. You might talk to somebody that are on. If you try one on, you know what the sizes are like. Okay, because that's a lot. I get a lot of questions about what size do I need. And I said, well. 
because it's not really a standard product. So stop by, try one on, see what the product's about, feel it, and then you know that'll help you down the road if you want to order one, or maybe it'll help somebody else out, give them some reference material um, for ordering. Okay, that's 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 it for the presentation. Questions? Uh, you know, I wanted to go back to these uh, these graphs we talked about. Yeah, so when we're talking about uh, the bad people um, in their training, they were, they were the top growers in the world, and we had these averages are down, right? And that, that, that by data numbers showing us the inconsistencies of performance versus what the guys are doing today. Question just to kind of clarify how. The leg swing, do you bring it in? Stuff. You said spread stuff, or do you loop it around? I mean, what, what are you looking for there? On the entry, um, you want to post up your whole left side, like the hinge of the door, okay? And then um, without letting the hip fall towards the middle of the circle, okay, the hip stays in place, you push the right side. And you can kind of think about like a skateboard kick a little bit. On that back side to help you get started, right? And this idea, and then you're, it's the whole side, it's the shot push shoulder hit, all of this moves together. And you push that as far out as you can, a hundred, in theory, 180 degree mirror image. Start here, middle of the spin, you should look 180 on the other side, okay? Uh, some ideas for acuing that is uh, we're in indoor season, if you're on a shoot of plywood, okay? Tell the kid they need to rotate so far out that when they turn, they're off the board. Okay, when they look down, they're out, they're out in, on the floor space. They're not on the board anymore. So that board's a hard line to get them to go around that post and left. Uh, another thing is a common problem for us is the athlete's diving to center. Right, they dive, they dive, they dive, they dive to center. You're always trying to pull them back. Sometimes I'll cue the athlete fall out. They rotate so far out here to the right side, so far out the corner that you fall out and you, you can't get back to center. Okay, because that gives them an idea of how far they can go. Okay, so if they're falling in, push them the other way. Well, that's something else a lot of like to do as a coach. Is if, you know, if they're going too far this way, take them to the far extreme because odds are you need you don't want to pull them back just a little bit from that dive. You need to get them way out, way away from that. So you put them in the middle of a four foot wide uh, plywood and then try to make, get them to step out is one of the things, or have them get their foot outside the width of it. Yeah, well, okay, if, if you're on a board, if you're on a board, or if you're on a board, they need to rotate so that the right side of their body, and it'll seem peripherally for them, that they're rotating off the board. Okay, like when they come out, when they come you know, in the circle, the board's over here and they're rotating off the board. Uh, so that's that idea. You can also do that with a line, on, like on a gym floor. Put them on the line, the left foot on the line, and they have to rotate over, like around this side of the line before they can come back to it. Get outside and come back. A good cue for that too is I tell them go to the corner. Sometimes if you stand, like if, if they're throwing, if this is the circle here, they're throwing that way. If you stand off to this corner over here, and you say side to corner, rotate to corner, so they have to push that that implement side to you on their way to the center, and that forces them, forces them to come all the way around. Yeah. Um, rotations to center. Do you have a name of any um, left-handed throwers that I can show my athletes? Because I've got a left-handed I'm struggling with. Uh, a common thing people do is you just get uh, just flip the video. Okay, you just flip it uh, for whoever you like to. Um, there is there is somebody who's a pretty good left-handed thrower. I can't think of them. I can't think right now. Um, yeah, yeah. Most left most left-handed throwers don't do as well. <laughs> Yeah, that seems to be the that seems to be the, uh, the average, no? Uh, but there, there are there are yeah, there are some that be pretty good. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, the, the easiest is to take what you want and just put it with it with the software. Yeah, yeah. I I would love to get better female models. You know, one of the problems is we don't nobody studies females. The problem is their implements are too they're too light. The women they cheat. They they can cheat too much, right? It's not a true example of how to that you know. So for a kid who's learning, a high school kid, they're, they're not strong. It doesn't work. Anymore. So I, you know, something I would like to see is uh, a big case study of women throwing heavy implements. You know, and I think from throwing heavy implements, you're going to see better techniques out of women. You know, nobody's putting that stuff out there. Right. Um, so what this what this technique is bringing about is it's called a transfer transfer of energy. Uh, and a lot of times with a block leg, it's talking about like a a car accident happening. Okay. Um, so that, I like to run a. Uh, the example of a uh, catapult versus a trebuchet. Do uh, you know, understand, you know what a trebuchet is? The difference between a uh, catapult, um, you know, it's a single arm with a breaker and it, and it stops. And it's a ton of force on the ring. And a trebuchet is one consistent long release. That's the difference between a hard stop block and a bent leg rotating shoulders long way around. Okay? It's a long, longer force longer path for force production. And in terms of longevity on the athlete, throwing the bent legs is um, much easier on the rigging. There's a lot less force on the body, okay? A lot of times, when people have notes, they, they say the, the good throws, the far throws feel easy, okay? The far throw felt easy because you made a mistake and you threw better, you threw with better biomechanics uh, technique that you practice, and it felt easier because the force wasn't in your body. Okay, a lot of times when we, we feel the force, when we feel strong, that implement is pushing into you. Okay? And you feel strong, but you're feeling strong for the wrong reasons. Okay, the, easy, the far throws feel easy because you're transferring energy to the implement. Okay, so that's another thing is um, the consistency of these athletes. When you start throwing like this, the consistency is there because they're not hitting five or eight good throws in a, in a training session. They're hitting 30 good throws in a training session, maybe one or two mistakes. And they're, um, because they're transferring energy, they're producing more power, more repeatedly, and they can do it day after day after day after day. The body's taking less wear and tear, okay? And instead of slamming the left leg down and blocking the momentum of the body, they are pulling the momentum of the body around, okay? That's why we post up that left leg, and I say, bro, I, I, when I say you're pulling that shoulder back, I don't care what a person does with the arm, it's all on the shoulder, okay? You crank, you, you, you rip that shoulder all the way behind your left hip, okay? And the reason you pull that left shoulder back is that's the easiest way to push the right shoulder forward, okay? And a lot of times you get to the front, and I see how they come up and stop, Right? It's the hand out. Shoulder. This is a big breakthrough for me when I started really throwing far. The other side, the body truck said, just throw shoulder. Throw whole shoulder. He said, I said, like, like this? He said, no. And this, this, the whole mechanism, the whole complex. You get the front, you throw the whole shoulder up there. Pull this one back, this one forward around the bent left, and that's where you start getting that continual rotation, that trebuchet model, okay? So and do you stay away with non-reverse hands? Do they do a lot of non, I mean, do they not do Yeah, the, 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 the non-reverse is a great way to learn this, especially okay. throwing off the left, yeah. Um, another thing I like to do is stand throws with the athletes, is I'll have them, the idea is that you, you shift the body up to the bent left first, once, and we do that to take the right out of play. Okay? The further forward you shift, the less weight you have on the right, you're forced to then use the shoulders for final for the, the final power. And what the stand throws then is when you're trying to get them to learn to throw off left, 
is they stand throw, you let them come over that leg. Actually, 100% of the throw off single support, left leg only, and let them come out over the, you know, straight forward, throwing the same. For your cue for a shot, you have row and bench. Yeah. You have one for, for disc. Same. 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 Yep. Yep. Same. Oh, uh, I mean, you know, you know, yeah, it's not the strike, but we're talking about the shoulder action. Right? Like I said, the arms, what the hands and the arms are doing doesn't really matter. It's all in the shoulders. Right? That's right. The same thing with uh, with the legs. You know, I don't cue an athlete to put their foot a certain place. I cue the hip. I right? put the hip there. Keep the leg back. Put the hip where it needs to go, and the, the foot will follow suit. Kind of out the middle. Would Would you work your uh, shot putters with the uh, that's okay for, yeah, you know, for understanding, but it's a very, very basic level. Okay. okay. With this stuff, take a broomstick, hold it this way, put the bottom on your hip bone, the top on the shoulder, and glue it to your body, and then make the athlete throw like that. They can do their rotations like this. Because with that line going straight to the body, they can't twist and break the torso. They have to, it's kind of like, when you're learning this, it's kind of like moving like, like pushing a fridge around, moving a big box, okay, the size, the size. Put the broom handle in here, it's better if the, the broom is on top, not just a stick. Give them weight, right, weight to work against. Here, and then you make them push this side around. You'll be amazed after a few attacks, they put that stick like that, they'll turn just like these guys. Right, they'll, they'll, they'll turn just like them all the way to the front. They'll get to the front, they'll stop, and they'll go, and they'll have a blank fit, stare in their face because they just move more efficiently than they have in their life. And they don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. It may sound stupid, but the handle in front or behind the, the hip? In front. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in front. Make sure it's against your body, though. Okay? Because you have to go on, cheat it, keep it out. It has to be locked in. Just a broom. Oh, broom. Yeah, just a broom, yeah. Put, push a broom with a 24 inch head, it works the best because that's it's weight up there, right? They can't, because they, they feel the vertical, right? As soon as they start spinning, there's weight up there, that bar works, they can feel it. So it makes them keep it nice and straight. Okay, so you do a little pouring down the throwers, but you're like, oh, you get a little rotational shot there as opposed to the wide items and the five touches. Uh, like, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> have them do both. Do you have an athlete? Say, do a glide, do a rotation, and then, you know, you should get a pretty, if they can turn, then you might as well let them turn. Uh, if they can't turn, keep them with a glide. You know, some kid, if, 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 if the athlete can't do simple calisthenic drills very easily, Probably better to stick one by. Um, also, I would say you have to do the stand throws, and if they can throw, if they can throw as far or a little bit further with the rotation than their stand, I say you, that that's a good indicator as well. Have them put them on rotate. Yeah. They're, 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 they throw discus as well. That's you know. You're just spinning, spinning, spinning. Because if you're teaching this technique, it's all the same. It's the same movement. It's just a little bit different dynamic of where the weight is. What's your take on the stand requirement as far as getting, learning the spin? The stand requirement? Can you give me more information about like what, what that is? So we have them in the back. Yeah. The stand to the right. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I call stand Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Um, for me, I, I would take one element out of that, and I would have them uh, <clears throat> leave, your, leave your right foot in the middle, and just 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 pull the one step. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I run that as a special strength exercise for my throwers, um, for learning, for power development. Yeah, I think that, that's a good example. But if you come to my another one of my sessions, we're going to talk about splitting up the throws in terms of getting the most out of your energy for the athlete and the, the um, development for training sessions. 
And we talk about what, what's a competitive exercise practice throw, what's a special strength exercise, when to implement that. And what's that session called? That's going to be 12 week strength cycle um, theory. Theory, that's tonight. <coughs> And then on Saturday, we're going to do the, the lab portion of that. The, 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 the applied 12 week strength um, on Saturday afternoon, that's, that's really more going to be more of kind of an automation of all of that. We're going to be kind of like free time to talk about everything in terms of applied use of things. I'll put on my shorts and do some more examples. Good. Any other questions? No, if not, come by, see me at the table, come see our products. Let us know what we can do for you. Thank you.